In times <laughs> like this, just what advice would you give entrepreneurs? Batten down the hatches. Well, first, hopefully you didn't go into some craziness and overextend yourself. So the first thing was, I hope you didn't take a valuation you shouldn't have just because it looked great on paper. You know, it was too high. But if you did, you're going to have to write the ship. And the biggest thing is the uh, is reminding your team that those numbers were all fabricated. Those were all made up kind of things and go back to the business of working on your mission and, and achieving that and also trimming the sales. So you have to go back and to first principles and stop, you know, thinking about this overinflated market it had has changed. It has changed dramatically. It will it will levelize again. We're going to swing the pendulum swing in one way, swing in the other way. But again, stay focused on the work. Go make your mission happen, but don't worry about all the craziness around it. We're going to take care of you. The biggest thing is taking care of your team. So I'm sure we could talk about this next question for hours, but in a nutshell, what are some lessons you learned the hard way? Oh, geez. <laughs> Let me count. Um, I think the biggest <laughs> one was understanding timing. You know, you, have, you could have great technology, you can have great things, understanding timing. You know, the market has to be ready or ready to listen to what the innovation you have. The second thing I think is really understanding how you're telling your story. And you have to tell a story of why, why, why. That's what's in the book, uh, Build. It's all about the why. Too many times tech founders and engineers and people in the, in the tech world worry about the what, what, what. It starts with the why. Why do customers need it? What pain are you solving? What do you need to do to get that message across and make sure then your product delivers on that? Stop worrying about the bits and bytes. Start working on the story and making sure that story is a painkiller, not a vitamin. Now, Google bought one of the things you built and that was Nest. It didn't necessarily go as planned. What's your take <laughs> on what went wrong, let's say there? Well, it was in, it was in the book, but I, I'll, how can we put it this way? We spent six months trying to figure out the right way to work together and if this marriage, what I called was a marriage, was going to work out. And so it was working okay for the first kind of two, three quarters. And then it was like the Tindler swindler. Uh, what we were sold, this bill of goods we were sold in this marriage, all of a sudden turned to be blown up. And it really boiled down to, um, I thought that a something they would purchase for 3.2 billion would be something they would take in and cherish and be and understand that they have to nurture it and, and take care of it. They were making so much money and they continue to make so much money, they went on to other and different things and we were just yet another toy that was a, 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 you know, a period of time. So for us, what we thought was going to be a great marriage turned out to be like a, a fling for them. And for us, we were kind of left hanging at the, you know, left hanging while they went and did other things. So it was really about focus and about leadership. Um, and, and, and that's what I think happened at the end of the day of why it didn't work out. Okay, speaking of another unorthodox marriage, that, that could happen between Elon Musk and Twitter. He's proposed, he said a few times sure. today, it, you know, it might not go through. But what do you make of that deal? Well, look, Elon's an innovator and he's a, a brash one at that. You have to give him credit for what he's manifested in this world and how he's shamed the auto industry to move and all these other things. I think, you know, we look at back in the days of the oil barons, what have you, and they bought media, right? They bought media to control the, share, the story, shape the message um, of what they were doing. I think, you know, that there's some echoes of that in, in, in Elon per, or trying to purchase Twitter. But I also think that there are things that Twitter needs to solve and haven't solved for many years um, in terms of the algorithms, how they, they work, um, some of, some of the, 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 the innovations in terms of editing tweets, deleting tweets, uh, content moderation. That said, you know, you could go all the way the other way where there's no controls, where you remove everything. And it becomes something that is reminiscent of a 4chan or an 8chan or whatever the latest toxic social media network or broadcast one to many platform is. So I hope that Elon is able to actually look at this and say, I'm going to divorce the world of the algorithm and revenue from the tweet stream and amplifying messages that could have misinformation, ugly information, uh, things that cause genocide and all those other things. We need to separate the capital and the revenue from the messages that are amplified by the algorithm. If they are tied like they have been, 
that's when we have the toxicity that that happens because if it bleeds it leads as you know and and i hope elon is going to be the doing the right thing even if he brings t trump back on trump shouldn't be amplified for re revenue gain so let's talk about that for a moment i want you to take a listen to what elon had to say about the banning of president trump today take a listen sure I would reverse the perma ban. I'll say I'm not, I don't own Twitter yet. So this is not like a thing that will definitely happen because what if I don't own Twitter? Is bringing Trump back on Twitter the right call? It depends on the algorithms. It depends on the other, it depends on the environment that he's brought back in. So to me, if he can amplify and he can continue the misinformation and that he has been doing uh, and, and then and that is for revenue purposes, then it is wrong. Everyone can have freedom of speech, but it has to come with con consequences. And it cannot be tied to revenue that says the more, the more toxic it is or the more uh, you know, entertainment value it is, you make more revenue. If that's the case, then he should not be allowed back onto the platform. It, everyone should have a level playing field and it shouldn't be tied to your revenue dollars that, you know, that is gonna be seen by the company itself. Now, Apple, today, just in time for you to join us, discontinued its yep. last iPod model. And obviously, the iPod led to two decades of, of, of innovation at Apple, led to the iPhone. But how do you reflect on kind of the end of an era for the iPod and the uh, thing that you are <laughs> the father of? <laughs> well, look, um, at the end of the day, technology marches on, OK? The beat never stops. You know, you could, I, I remember I lamented the day when the Apple II was dead, but the Apple II died in the 90s, well past the date when, you know, the Mac took over and, and in the later 80s. Um, then again, you know, when we look at it, the iPod was already starting to be cannibalized or dying around the time of the iPhone, right? It was always understood that at some point at some sometime the, the cannibalization of the iPod would be complete. I can't believe that the iPod has lasted this long, actually, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's an end of an era, but it is a cornerstone. It's an indelible piece of Apple history, of technology in general history, just like the Apple II was, the Mac is. And those things are going to live on well beyond. And they, if it wasn't for the iPod, we wouldn't have the iPhone. So all of these things are stepping stones. That's how technology works. So I can, you know, I can, I can think fondly of those days and those incredible times. And the Apple that we know today would not have existed without that development and that, that crazy time, that fun time that was iPod. So how would you rate the innovation and building that's happening mm -hmm. at Apple today? Again, in a nutshell, especially how they're managing or navigating these supply chain issues. Well, you know, the supply chain, let's put cast that aside. But if you look at innovation in general, uh, and I think they're doing a great job in the supply chain, given what we're hearing from other companies and those kinds of things. So I think, you know, look at the quarterly results that just came out. So I think managing supply chain, given the macro environment, is really difficult. And they're doing a good job trying to thread that needle. But when you look at innovation at Apple today, innovation at Apple today is very strong. It's not the same kind of innovation that the consumer thinks of innovation, whether it was the iPod or iPhone or AirPods or what have you. When you look at the innovation, it's happening all at the, the lowest levels. The sensors, face ID, touch ID. We have things like um, uh, uh, the M1 processor. That has been an innovation that was born out of the 2008 timeframe when I was there and Bob Mansfield and I bought PA Semi and created the, old, you know, the, 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 the Mac Silicon uh, for, or excuse me, the Apple Silicon for the iPhone. It now is now the Mac Silicon. It took a long time to get there. But those kinds of innovations are cement Apple into the future for more and more, um, for more and more transformation, more and more innovation. So we're seeing the, the hints of that. It's happening at the lowest levels, but it will come okay. out in other products over time.